evening and welcome to this Ash Wednesday service, both to those who are gathered here in our sanctuary as well as those who join us from our live stream. And as we come to this night and mark this time in worship and begin our Lenten journey, may we find God's Spirit guiding us and leading us to places of new beginnings and new life. So may we now turn our hearts and our minds and our spirits to the worship of God. Create new hearts, O God, and make our spirits strong. Show us the way, show us the way to our cross, so dying we may live anew. Have mercy, O God, in your goodness, O God. Show us your love and forgiveness. From all our guilt, please wash us, O Lord. From all our sin, make us whole. From all our sin, make us whole. So God and make our spirit strong. Show us the way, show us the way to a cross. So dying we may live anew. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. And for those joining us from home who may not have a printed service order, your response will be, we belong to God. From dust we came, to dust we will return. We belong to God. We gather in penitence, we gather in confidence. We belong to God. At the beginning of Lent, and every moment of our lives, we belong to God. Joe. 
I invite us now to join in the litany of confession. Lent is a journey of deepening reflection and renewal, an opportunity to make new commitments in faith. We prepare for the journey by setting aside burdens that would weigh us down. Let us turn to God and confess our sin. Lord God, it is hard to think that we will die someday. We dream, make plans, and talk about what we'll do in the near future. We don't always think about what you want. Instead, we make choices that we think are good for us. We confess that we forget we need you all the time. We confess that sometimes we make choices that aren't what you want. We don't know what is best for our lives. Holy God, we are sorry for our sin. Help us to remember we live because of you. Help us to do what you want us to do through Jesus our Lord. We begin our journey to Easter with the sign of ashes. In keeping with the ancient tradition of the Christian church, ashes are placed on the forehead of worshipers. The ancient sign speaks of the frailty and uncertainty of human life, calls for heartfelt repentance, and urges us to place our hope in God alone. They are accompanied with words from Genesis. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you return. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of dust of the earth. May these ashes remind us of our mortality and penitence and teach us again that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And for all of us here, and if you're joining us from your home, if you have ashes and would like to place them on your forehead, I invite you to take a finger and to place them in the ash, and then to make the mark of the cross upon your forehead. And if you're a family, you're welcome to certainly do that for one another, if you wish. Remember, you are dust, and to dust, you return. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you return. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you return. Not fully given 
direction gave our visions wider view an offering of ashes an offering to you then rise again from ashes let healing come to pain though spring has turned to winter and sunshine turned to rain the rain will use for growing and create the world anew from an Siblings in Christ, receive this assurance of forgiveness. Remember these words from the Apostle Paul. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thanks be to God. The words of Scripture that greet us this evening begin with the words from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Receive these words from chapter 58, beginning in verse 1. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they sought me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask me righteous, of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house when you, when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden. 
like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. And receive also these words from the Gospel of Matthew. I read from chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but your Father, who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and you alone our redeemer. And for this, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Well, I have to tell you that Lent is probably my favorite season. Lent and Holy Week and Easter, my favorite time within the Christian year. And while some people probably have favorite stories they like to hear at Christmas time, I'll confess I have a favorite story for Lent one that I read every year as a part of my entering into the season, one that speaks to me about what this season offers, what it is about, these rituals that we go through, whether it's putting some ashes on our forehead, reminding ourselves of our mortality, whether it's confessing our shortcomings and mistakes and asking God for forgiveness whether it's praying, attending to our spiritual lives in a more intentional way for 40 days, or whether it's fasting, abstaining from something, or whether it's being charitable and caring 
a little more and in different ways for our neighbors. Whatever our rituals and spiritual practices are that we may find ourselves taking on in this season, or even the ones we see other people do and we're not so sure what it all means and what it's all about and if it's really for us. I come back to this story, this story about revival, the story about beginning over again, which is very much what the season of Lent is about. Journeying and beginning again, starting new beginnings, turning around. These are words from Robert Fulgham, and his story is in the book called The Ritual of Our Lives. And he says this, Nothing about being human amazes me more than the capacity to be revived and for revival. How dull and meaningless and hopeless life can seem only to become exciting, vibrant, and filled with hope the next day. Whole nations come back from destruction and oppression when great problems get addressed and resolved. All of our exits may become entrances. The human capacity to take whatever life dishes out and come back is never to be underestimated. How amazing it is, knowing we're all going to die anyhow, that we are so determined to live as well as we can, no matter what. For all our little deaths, we defy our fate and come to life again and again and yet again. Daily, we redeem ourselves in unspoken rituals of renewal. Daily, we get up and go to work in the construction business of building and repairing and remodeling a life. The ritual of revival has many names. Born again and healing or simply getting our act together. Whatever the name, however large or small the act, the urge to resemble, reassemble the fragments of our lives into a whole is the same. Last Sunday afternoon, I went through, Fulgham writes, his, my drawer ritual. Restless, with time on my hands and too many things to do in my mind, I paced around the house trying unsuccessfully to get my energy focused. I turned almost unconsciously to the drawers, or as I have come to think of them, the somewhere drawers, as in, it's in here somewhere. Here's what belongs in a series of small drawers at the top of my chest. Wallet, keys, spare eyeglasses and sunglasses, gloves, watch, ring, pen and pencil, address book, notepad, small camera, checkbook, Swiss army knife, small tape recorder, small tape measure, handkerchiefs, pen light, and a small pocket comb. All useful objects. There are several small wicker baskets distributed among the drawers that keep things efficiently ordered and handy. Impressed? Don't be. Over time, in the daily scramble of coming and going, anything small and loose gets dumped higgledy-piggledy into the drawers. All the odds and ends out of pockets and briefcase, all the bits and pieces that seem to turn up on the table, and all the loose parts that are handed to me by my wife with the comment, here, this is yours, put it somewhere. In the somewhere drawers, of course. Inevitably, the, there comes the crisis when what I put somewhere, though, is nowhere to be found. Last Sunday, I carefully emptied out all of the drawers and laid out the pieces as if they had been found in an archaeological dig. A small-scale museum display of life. In addition to most of the items listed already that are supposed to be there, I found these. Loose change. 
matches, both used and unused. Kleenex, ditto. Nails, screws, nuts, bolts, and washers. Miscellaneous mechanical parts of unknown purpose. Pipe cleaners, a computer disc, one of my wife's lipsticks, various notes scribbled on scraps of paper, two unmailed letters, three open rolls of Rolaids, four chapsticks, mostly used up, five assorted small batteries, six odd buttons, loose pipe tobacco, one sock, one cufflink, two pencil stubs, refill cartridges for a fountain pen and ball ballpoint pen, both used and unused, bicycle wrench, a clothespin, a deck of cards, an unsmoked cigar, a partially smoked cigar, a nail file and toenail clippers, gum wrappers, but no gum, used and unused band-aids, the corpses of a fly, a moth, and two tiny beetly bugs, and lots of dust and tiny trash. I kid you not. But then, you're not surprised, are you? Industriously, I washed out the drawers with soap and water, relined them with brown craft paper, carefully fitted, and ruthlessly triaged the former contents. Much of it went in the trash can. A sack of possibly useful items got dumped into an even bigger drawer in the kitchen. This is called putting things somewhere else. Someday, somehow, I'll sort that one out. Carefully, thoughtfully, I replaced the proper contents in their proper little wicker baskets in their proper drawers and slid the drawers home in their slots in the chest. The drawer ritual is complete. My drawers are neat and clean and worthy of respect, and on some level, for at least a little while, so is my life. The ritual of the drawer is deeply satisfying. Such an accomplishment. How can something so mundane seem so important? It has ritual value as a metaphor for larger designs. I wonder, how many times in my life have I done this? Often enough to know. I will go through the cycle again sometime next year. Often enough to know this ritual for what it is, not tidying drawers, but a symbolic manipulation of the paradoxical nature of my life in general. Order and purpose, giving way to disorder and confusion, giving way to getting organized again. On a secret level, the ritual of revival. Even undressing, taking a shower and washing my hair and trimming my beard and filing my nails, and then getting into clean, fresh clothes will suffice sometimes. Same deal, getting my act together. Whatever it takes, whatever works, to lever the wheels back on the tracks. For me, that's very much what Lent and the rituals and practices that are offered are about. Going back to the drawers, cleaning them out through a ritual of revival beginning again. Seeing how we can get the wheels back on track. God in the passages today speaks to us about what it looks like to get wheels back on the tracks. It is to embrace the kind of practices that open us up to a kind of justice that lifts people up, that loose the bonds, that brings people together, draws people in. One that looks out for others, takes away the iniquities, and breathes love into the world. Fulgham goes on to say, what provo provokes this restless ritual 
of revision and revival. A need for structure, purpose, order in life, yes. Boredom, confusion, anxiety, yes, those too. And sometimes sorrow, failure, and fear set us in motion. Cleansing and revival are called for. And the question now is how to die this death and come to life again. Confession and repentance are old rituals. Every year, Jews observe the Day of Atonement when they confront their failures and transgressions and sins and get squared away with God and their families and friends and neighbors. Catholics may pursue the same end in a confessional with a priest. Protestants may offer prayers that begin with, I confess to Almighty God. And in the secular world, we may turn to counselors and psychiatrists and to organize groups of people to have our failings or griefs or hopes or intentions. This is the ritual of reconciliation. It involves the ritual recognition of damage done to ourselves and others, the ritual of reunion with the better parts of ourselves, the ritual of reaffirmation of the power of human beings to help one another. Our journey of Lent is both singular and personal, but also communal. And it ultimately draws us to be not only closer to God, but also to one another. So that the kind of revival that is promised at the end of Lent, namely Easter, is the kind of promise that truly is good news for all of God's creation. Blessings to all of us on our Lenten journeys. your 
peace and your hope. For it's you that I seek, and of you my heart speaks, and it's you my glance seeks, your presence I need. May we open our hearts in a time of prayer, beginning first in silent conversation with our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. God of all seasons, in your pattern of things, there is a time for keeping and a time for losing, a time for building up and a time for pulling down. In this season of Lent, as we journey to the cross, help us to discern in our lives what we must lay down and what we must take up, what we must end and what we must begin. Give us grace to lead a disciplined life in glad faithfulness and with the joy that comes from a closer walk with Christ. For your church around the world, we ask new life. For all who carry out ministries in your church, we ask grace and wisdom. For people who have accepted spiritual disciplines, we ask inspired discipleship. For Christians in every land, we ask new unity in your name. For those who cannot believe, we ask your faithful love. For rulers in every land, we ask your guidance. For people who suffer and sorrow, we ask your healing peace. Holy God, your word, Jesus Christ, spoke peace to a sinful world and brought humanity the gift of reconciliation by the suffering and death he endured. Teach us who bear his name to follow his example. May our faith hope, and charity. Turn hatred to love, conflict to peace, and death to eternal life. Through Christ our Lord. So we humbly offer this prayer along with the silent meditations of our hearts, even as we are bold to pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. I invite you to join with me in these words of commissioning and then benediction. The cross, we will take it. The bread, we will break it. The pain, we will bear it. The joy, we will share it. The gospel, we will live it. The love, we will share it. The light, we will cherish it. The darkness, God shall perish it. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, and we may show forth your glory. By the cross and passion of our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, praise and glory, wisdom, thanks, honor.
Salvation belongs to our God. 